Hey guys, how are we doing? Back with another video from Annie News. We are continuing with the Fake Grand Order videos, the final one so far at the moment. There is a reason why I haven't done the Ishtar one, I'll get into that at the end. But this is every noble phantasm from Fake Grand Order Babylonia explained. The noble phantasms were cool, but what the hell was going on with those? Let's check them out. I'm gonna be honest, even though Fake Grand Order Babylonia wasn't done by Evotable, the animation definitely went above It the did look good. But where they completely captivated my full attention was when Servant, Goddess, Grand Assassin, or Dick Wizard was using their Noble Phantasms. These were such momentous feats that I couldn't help but be in awe at what I was watching every single time. It did look good. They truly captured the essence of how impactful a Noble Phantasm should be. Yeah, even However, with the sound and everything. I think a greater level of appreciation for these Noble Phantasms could be had. Especially when you take into account how these ultimate abilities tie into their character's deeper lore. Mm. So yeah, there's always like history behind it, isn't there? talk a little bit about what exactly that power was. And if you want to know the full extent of each servant's origins and powers, then feel free to check out my other servant profile videos as well. But now, let's begin. Cool. Right, and the reason I haven't done the Ishtar one is because my laptop I originally used is just broke. And I've already recorded the reaction to it, and I don't do reactions to stuff I've already seen. So I apologize, but I am not faking pretending I don't know what's happening in the video again, so we're right on from episode zero there we go. and episode one, we get to see Mash use Lord Camelot, mm. Castle of the Distant Utopia. It's a noble phantasm cool. that's originally possessed by the Knight of the Round Table, Galahad, right. the son of Lancelot. Oh, cool. He wasn't the greatest fighter, but his defensive nature and tactician mentality were unrivaled, mm. and it's his heroic spirit that's infused into Mash's body. Ah, right, okay. Did not know that, that's cool. Lord Camelot is a noble Phantasm that represents that the makes castle sense. the Knights of the Round Table resided in. The shield itself is said to be made from the Round Table, yeah, and it's meant to provide the same form of protection that the Tower and Walls of Camelot once mm -hmm. did. What it does is generate a conceptual defensive barrier that's a big defensive thing, and it? it's just like ultimate oh, it's it's user. Camelot this means walls. That it's a physical barrier with a fixed ceiling for how much damage it can take. It's a protection of the soul that doesn't register on the laws of physics. So long as Mash doesn't lose hope. Lord Camelot will not falter. As long as she believes, so, cool. given that there's no limit to the amount of defense it can produce, Whoa. it's definitely one of the most powerful defensive noble phantasms. Okay. Second, probably well, having no limit, Avalon. damn. Ooh. In episode two, we see Enkidu use Age of Babylon, the wisdom of the people. Wisdom of the people. It's interesting to note that without this noble phantasm, Gilgamesh's Gatlin gun variant to his Gate of Babylon wouldn't even exist. Hmm. See, Age of Babylon allows Enkidu to create any type of weapon he wants from the Earth. As a living weapon himself, one that was created by the gods, he has the ability to generate any tool or weapon he needs from the ground, each being a brand new original creation of the highest quality. Hmm. So, when Gilgamesh first encountered this never-ending onslaught of weapons being projected at him, his only way to keep up was to do the same. Was to copy it, he right. He matched Enkidu's output of weapons by launching his own directly from the so, game. So, oh, interesting. At the time, the two were evenly matched, as Enkidu's Age of Babylon was perfectly equal to Gilgamesh's Gate. Gate of Babylon, It was yeah, a power wow. strong enough to keep Gilgamesh occupied in battle for days. And no less against a Gilgamesh that was in his prime. Damn, if that's you want to know which one's stronger, something else, then perhaps take a look towards Fate's Strange Fake. But Keep bringing that up as well. Gilgamesh, uh, the cast of version we see in Fate Grand Order uses fate, a significantly weaker fate, version of Fake Strange Fake. Remember, since Gilgamesh distributed all his weapons except for magical staffs to the people of Uruk, his Gate of Babylon has lost a lot of offensive power. Hmm. Now, rather than bombard his out. opponents with swords and spears, he instead opens the gate to cast a barrage of long-ranged spells. It's definitely not as strong as his Archer version, but luckily he has another God, Archer Gilgamesh is something else. <laughs> Next up from episode 8 is Ushiwakamaru's Shana O's Ushiwakamaru. A special type of noble phantasm that consists of five different She was cool, but I didn't like how they turned her into like legends. evil legends versions of herself at the end. Well, it was cool at first, but then they went on for too long. Commander of the Genji clan. Unfortunately, we only got to see two of these techniques in action. Mm -hmm. The first was Asumi Dori. Short Asumi with the Dori. Heavenly blade. A single so powerful cool. slash with her Usumi Dori blade that is very difficult to dodge. Reason being that the strike is preceded by an advanced martial arts technique known as Shikuchi. God, the but animation was on point Shikokumaru with this show. It was so on point. Instantly close the distance between herself and her opponent. Her second feat was the CGI in places was a bit of a Dando Uda. This refers back to the legendary sea battle of Dando Uda in the year 1185. Hmm. Ushiwakamaru was leading the entire Genji naval fleet against the cool rival Cool history. Whoop. So. 
what this noble phantasm embodies was the act of Ushiwakamaru leaping between ships during raging tides to best the enemy clan in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Well... It's this feat that enables her to not only jump higher, but also traverse any sort of terrain so long as there is a minimal foothold, making it look as if jumping between <laughs> Bay Blade. was a child's <laughs> play. Now, those were only Act 2 and Act 4 of her Wandering Tales. There's still three other techniques what? that provide more to Ushiwakamaru's kit. Cool. Act 1 is called Eye of Shiva, detecting the six secret teachings. An ability that instantly relocates every person within a specified area. Oh, well, that's it's cool. It's highly useful for breaking enemy ranks and causing mass confusion on the battle. Yeah, imagine that. I was over here. Steadfast position, a more defensive technique that creates an imitation of Benkei's body to block an incoming attack. The more faith Ushiwakamaru has in Benkei, the stronger this Benkei shield will be. Cool. And Finally, Act 5 is Hoemaru. Hoemaru. Imagine if Ushiwakamaru like was part of the Hashira and she could use breathing techniques to make her blade super effective against demons. That's pretty much what this is, bringing us to the last technique of her watering tales. Now, in that same fight with Gorgon, Ooh. we then come to see Leonidas use the Mopo yes. Guardian of the Hot Gates. So if you've cool. ever seen the movie 300, then this noble phantasm is pretty much an embodiment of that event. Yeah, it's just it's a reenactment launched of those Spartans by Leonidas who defended against a Persian invasion force of 100,000. Just as it was in history, this noble phantasm is typically used as a counter It looks so cool. It initiates with the summoning of 300 Spartans, each possessing a mid-range endurance rank that's pretty decent for any oh, servant. It looks so Their epic. purpose is to defend Leonidas and his master from the enemy's attack. After holding that defense, Leonidas then launches a counterattack that scales in power with the number of Spartans left over. Yes. If you take into account what we saw in Babylonia, it's almost as if the counterattack looked as powerful as the defense itself. Mm. But at its core, this is a more defensive noble phantasm than anything else. The counterattack is just a nice little bit of damage on top. Right. After all, we remember the Battle of Thermopylae not for his offensive turns on the Persian army, but rather his outstanding defense that resisted their consistent advances for three days straight. Pushed them off there. Next oh, we have God. Quetzalcoatl's Quetzalcoatl, Quetzalcoatl. The Serpent. A pterosaur from the Jurassic Age whose she was cool. derives from this Mesoamerican She's very goddess. fun. The pterosaur itself is the noble phantasm. Except the ones that she summons aren't your everyday Quetzalcoatlists from the Cretaceous period. Mm -hmm. No. For someone as strong as Quetzalcoatl, she writes a significantly more powerful phantasmal version of them. Divine beasts that have authority over lightning, winds, and rain, giving them the ability to manipulate these aspects of the world. In episode 13, we get to see Arashkagal use a brand new noble phantasm, one that was unique to the anime, Namu Matsu oh, cool. Other than the context we were given in the anime, it's hard to interpret how this attack relates to Arashkagal's actual myth. I mean, Gugulana was her husband once upon a time, mm -hmm. but how that affects the impact of this powerful spear strike is yet to be revealed. Immediately after this fight, the old man of the mountain appears and uses Azriel, the angel that announces death. Although it appears that the noble phantasm's effect is caused by the sword, that's actually not the case at all. Oh, okay. The sword he wields has no name. It's nothing more than a common weapon that anyone could use. Oh. Now, Azriel is the essence of the noble phantasm itself. It's the ability or technique to impose the concept of death onto literally anything by applying oh. Azrael to his sword. Be it a person, primordial god, or even abstract concept like Ereshkigal's connection to the three goddess alliance, just kill it. he can impose death onto each of these things with a single Oh, count. that so makes sense. basically he can kill literally anything. So he kills the connection. As someone who is quite literally the physical embodiment of death, Whoa. anything he imposes death upon then has a low chance of instantly dying. That's pretty crazy, especially when you consider that Tiamat could have been one shot when she gained the concept of death. Huh. Anyway, the name this noble Whoa. phantasm takes after is the Angel of Death. Supposedly, when God created death, death looked at Azrael and proceeded to submit to him. Because of this, Azrael gained the authority to determine what shall live and what shall die. die wow. So, it's a very fitting name Looks for an so ability cool. possessed by someone who pretty much has that same responsibility. In episode 14 and 15, Anna reveals her possession of the mystic eyes Sibylla, yeah, yeah. the same eyes possessed by her future self Medusa. Mm -hmm. The thing is, Medusa possesses these eyes as a skill, allowing her to use the petrification ability whenever she wants. However, due to being a younger version of Medusa, Anna hasn't gained these mystic eyes yet. Right, so she she's can a younger only version. use them while calling her noble phantasm, Caress of the Medusa. I thought she was one of the, the sisters, but I must have been it's wrong. It's pretty straightforward, just a single target attack that turns the opponent to stone. 
typically opening up a window to strike that the opponent would not be able to defend. Skipping to episode 17, now that Tiamat has entered the stage, it's time for the goddesses to show their true power. First, we saw Ishtar use Angal Takigalshi. Angal Takigalshi. It's a representation of the myth where Ishtar comes across a mountain whose natural beauty far surpasses her own. So she destroyed it. Being a goddess of beauty meant that this mountain's very existence was an affront on her own authority. Therefore, she thought that it shouldn't be allowed to exist. Yes. So she Thou shall not be as beautiful as I. With an increasing amount of divine force in every step. Then, with a single thrust of her spear into the mountain's core, she caused the entire range to collapse. Boom. It's this act of annihilating an entire mountain that's replicated by this noble phantasm. First, Ishtar activates Mana's warp function to open up a portal to Venus as it was And then she can just fire Venus down. Explain that in the Ishtar video. Planet, projects it into a form that's shootable from her bow, then fires it like an arrow towards her enemy. If I manage to recover the video, I'll upload it, but I'm not recording the reaction to it again. It looks so good. She can just recreate the thing that killed the dinosaurs. Because of this, it's what provides her with a significant portion of her divinity and subsequent power. So, what this noble fantasy The animation does was so amazing on that. ...releases a portion of Quetzalcoatl's authority over the sun, allowing her to unleash these solar winds that scorch everything in their path, almost as if she was using the sun itself to burn the entire landscape. It's insane. It's an ability it's so strong that not only did it burn away a majority of Tiamat's mud, but it also turned the ground into molten lava. It's even been said to have enough literal firepower to vaporize Bodak in its entirety. Just gone. But it's Pietro del Sol that sets the stage for the variant of her much stronger second noble phantasm. The one that imitates the impact of the meteorite that wiped out the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. So Zyakotl. cool. <laughs> Flame Zyakotl. Flame gods to ashes. In mythology, it's meant to symbolize her own temple in flames. The one that she willingly burnt to the ground in order to prevent a rival god from gaining the truth. You shall inside. never have it. <laughs> Normally, this is translated into an ability that envelops the opponent with fire that prevents them from using their noble phantasm. However, due to her passion for Lucha Libre, she modified it to the time wrestling in that. I love it. It's so cool. Adds to a fighting not style. Tiamat, the regular Zyakawaddle would be a devastating pile driver or dropkick from thousands of meters in the air. A dropkick that we now know as. What's that? What she said. <laughs> but when that's combined with the that's power output from Pietro del Sol, I'm not repeating it. Don't need to. <laughs> enhanced to the point where it would have an effect similar to a mass extinction level meteorite. She leaps into space, then falls into a drop kick that replicates the power of the drop meteorite. Drop kick if you go it all the way from the the same meteorite that brought this goddess to our planet millions of years ago. In the next episode. Gorgon used Pandemonium Ketus, Pandemonium forced Ketus. to seal Pandemonic Temple. This is a rather terrifying noble phantasm, because by calling its true name, Medusa gives up the part of her that's a goddess. She essentially accepts the fact that she's the monster that everyone in Greek mythology made her out wow. to be, and by doing so, she truly becomes the Gorgon, the fully metamorphosized version of Medusa that devoured her own sisters. Medusa typically tries to deny this fact with all her heart. She tries her best to cling to the only part of her that wasn't monstrous, her but. divinity. That's why she would become so enraged whenever Anna or Leonidas would call her Gorgon. Yeah. It's also Stop why she with those eyes. phantasm. Doing so would be the same thing as accepting her true form. And that was something she wanted to avoid at all costs. But when she does finally come to terms with what she really is, well, that's when we can see Medusa at her See, the CGI was a bit off there, but I, just, I don't know. By turning into true Gorgon with Pandemonium. Oh, Everything around her becomes petrified, and all organic life becomes liquefied. Anything turned to stone has zero normal means of returning back to normal. So anything short of a servant caught within this noble phantasm's area of attack likely gets turned into a puddle of blood and bones, or becomes a statue for the rest of eternity. Shortly after this, Gilgamesh uses the noble phantasm that's unique to his caster form. Right. With anger, King's signal cannon. Remember, so... Gil gave his collection of weapons Specific to, to cast a form. Work, each of which were intended to be launched from the Dingers mounted along the walls <laughs> the of the dinger. city. But <laughs> when <laughs> King's signal cannon is called, <laughs> Gilgamesh gains control of all 360 Dingers, proceeding to fire <laughs> them simultaneously to launch a concentrated barrage of what's essentially the collective power of mankind. 
Literally every weapon from Gilgamesh's treasury is launched at the target. And given what we saw in the anime, that's pretty much exactly what happened. Mm. So it's a very straightforward double phantasm. What may have been a bit more confusing was when Enkidu turned his own body into the chains of heaven to fight Tiamat. This was Enkidu's second double phantasm, Anuma Elish. Oh humans, let us restrain the gods. That's cool. As an existence created for the sole purpose of keeping Gilgamesh bound to the heavens, Anuma Elish was the ultimate attack to do just that. But after becoming Gilgamesh's friend, friend uh, he's he not going to use that, is he? Use this power for the sake of humanity. I shall protect so what happens him. Is, Enkidu uses a significant amount of energy from the world to transform his own so body into a divine construct that the world can recognize. In this case, it was the chains of heaven. Then, just like how he does with Age of Babylon, he launches himself at the target for a large-scale piercing attack. What's unique about this double phantasm, though, is that the source of its power comes directly from the counterforce. What this means is that the more of a threat to humanity the opponent is, the stronger Enkidu's attack will be. Right, it's a that's double cool. phantasm that's meant to preserve the integrity of the world and its people. In episode 20, so the more danger they're in, the more effective it is. That's cool. To create an attack that replicates the same feat of Ishtar destroying the mountain. Kurikigal or Kala. The bellows of Kurikigal or Kala. It's essentially the same noble phantasm as Ishtar's. But rather than the attack being shot from the heavens to the earth below, it's, it's from below to from up. The underworld to the ground above. That's cool. Ereshkigal is able to materialize a shrine given to her by her husband, a god who was known to rule the underworld at her side. Hmm. By summoning this shrine, Ereshkigal pretty much brings the underworld to her, granting her all the authorities she would normally have while in the underworld, even when not being in the underworld. Cool. The attack itself certainly isn't as strong as Ishtar's, but it does open up the field for Ereshkigal to become more useful. Now, I was hoping that Merlin using Garden of Avalon would have given us more context on what this noble phantasm actually, actually does. Actually, yeah. But unfortunately, we didn't get too much info. Mm. As I'm sure you know, Merlin is usually trapped within the eternal utopia yep, of Avalon. usually can't leave. A place within no person can die and no evil can exist. It's a perfectly pure land free from the decay and destruction of the natural world. When Merlin calls this noble phantasm, the area around the tower called the Garden of Avalon is replicated. He pretty much summons portions of Avalon to the immediate area. Yeah. Now, what I assume happens after is that because Merlin has materialized Avalon itself, the blessings that come from being within Avalon's domain are applied as well. You would assume, wouldn't you? Yeah. summoned areas could very well be immune to curses or even death, making it a very useful defensive ability. Though, the full extent of this noble phantasm remains a mystery, which honestly is something we've already come to expect from Merlin. Finally, we get to what could very well be the strongest noble phantasm in the entire Fate universe. Oh, Aya, oh of which course. Which produces the devastating yes. attack Anuma Elish. Mm -hmm. Now, Aya isn't something that can be so easily explained in a few lines. I can spend an entire video discussing its complex nature and origins. I suppose the important it was cool aspect that he used to know it is in that the, in is this primordial sword that can create winds that tear the very fabric of space. They're described as compressed and intertwined layers of wind that turn into gaps between space and time. These result in an undefendable attack that tends to destroy everything in its path. Anywhere the winds cut, a void of nothingness will open it's up just and begin so to swallow OP. up Gilgamesh is just ridiculous, It's an attack that man. attempts to replicate the very instance of creation, Genesis. Of course, there's definitely more to it than just that. But as I said earlier, if you want to know more, I have all these full servant profile videos that go much more in depth with their lore and abilities. The most recent one was on Ishtar, so feel free to check that Keep one out. Keep reminding them. <laughs> the description. But yeah, that's every noble phantasm from Fate Grand Order Babylonia. This cool. was a pretty fun video to make, so if you want to see another one just like it for any of the other Fate series, then go ahead and let me know in the comments below. Oh, that'd be boss, actually, anyway, yeah. As always, thank you so much for watching. Yeah. And if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time. Ciao. So, yeah, I did do the Ishtar one, but my laptop I usually use is completely screwed, and I can't get it sorted because of everything's going on. Luckily, I still have this dinky thing here that I'm using. And uh, I don't like recording reactions that I've already done, so ain't getting any fake stuff from this guy. But that was a cool video. That noble phantasm was cool. A video was cool. I wanna check out. I'm gonna check out next the um, East Kai Quartet Easter egg videos because <laughs> I'm currently watching East Kai Quartet. Quite enjoying it. And I thought, you know what? He's got these videos about it. Thought that'd be fun. And um, we're just gonna go from there and see what I can do. And I feel poo for only uploading two videos a day. I was really enjoying four, but because of the way this laptop works that I'm using now, 
it's a struggle. Like yesterday, I had to export a video three times before it actually played with audio. So please bear with me, and I'm going to try and do two videos a day. But thank you guys very much for watching. What do you guys think of that? What do you guys think of this? Click like, subscribe, haven't already. Leave comments down below. Let me know what I should watch and discuss in future videos. And I'll see you guys. It's all you guys. Next time.